Well, it's really nice to be back, uh, surrounded by so many people in real life. And I have to just say that um, I was here last year and had a conversation in front of a completely empty auditorium, and it was surreal. And uh, as a native New Yorker, I, I really just want to um, thank you all in the audience for being here. And I can't wait to interact with you um, in real life. And for those of you who are joining us on Zoom, uh, we wish you were here in New York, and uh, we do look forward to your questions, and we will get to them as part of the session. Um, but for now, uh, we're just gonna start out with some introductions. Uh, my name is Micah Koch, and um, I'm a partner with Blackhorn Ventures, where uh, we invest in uh, technology solutions that are providing digital infrastructure uh, for resource efficiency and industrial decarbonization. And uh, I'm joined by Fiona Cousins. I'm gonna let her introduce herself and uh, then we'll pass it to Matt Venger and Elizabeth. And uh, maybe as you introduce yourselves, um, you know, what you're working on now and uh, ways that your work is confronting the climate crisis. So my name is Fiona Cousins. I'm the chair of Arup in the Americas. Arup is an engineering design consulting planning um, and advisory firm. It's always difficult to remember all four of those things in one breath. Uh, and um, my particular work, or the things that I've been doing on the climate change uh, activities recently, are sort of twofold. One is I've been on the advisory board for Local Law 97 in, in New York. And uh, the second thing is that as a firm, about a year ago at COP26, we committed to doing life, whole life cycle carbon um, analysis for all of the buildings projects that we do. So understanding what the embodied and operational carbon is, the demolition and destruction is a more difficult challenge, but figuring out how to do that and how to make that happen through all of our projects has been sort of a big piece of work for the firm over the last year. Hello, I'm Manvendra. Uh, I come from India. It's a place where uh, you know, 22 of the most polluted cities, 30 most polluted cities of the world are in our country. It's not the most ideal place to bring up your children. I have a daughter, I'm extremely concerned about where it, where she grows up, where the most basic conditions for human flourishing are so gravely compromised. So I started working on this project about seven years back, which is uh, creating a new developmental narrative for housing human settlements. Uh, and uh, the premise and its resonance with confronting the climate crisis is just simply the terrif terrestrial engineering of completely degenerated barren lands and transforming them into making more livable, more affordable, and uh, much more sustainable uh, human habitats. Great. I'm Elizabeth Thompson, and I work at the US Green Building Council. And prior to coming to USGBC, I worked in architecture. And in that, um, after 15 years of loving making places, sort of one project at a time, I was thrilled to come to a place where USGBC um, gets to make this incredible system that people can tap into and identify the strategies that work well for their projects and their unique places and people. And so that is what I get to work on with a great group of people. Awesome. So Elizabeth, we're going to start with you. Yeah. And um, curious how you, how you reconcile this idea of scalable and replicable mm -hmm. versus more individualized kind of local community-driven projects. And from where you stand um, as a representative of, a, of an organization and behind a system, yeah. how do you think about that tension between replicability and scalability versus smaller kind of community-driven projects um, that, that people are advancing in light of, of, uh, of the climate crisis that we, that we face? That's a great question. I think the common thread might be listening. So whether it's an individual project or a system, that you have to be reactive to the place and the people and the environment and be able to keep learning. So when designers are imagining a place and conceptualizing how whatever they're sort of inserting into that environment or building on if there's an existing condition, how that can be better than what came before, um, they have to continually listen to the place and the people. And then I think when you look at that scalable aspect, we get to learn from experts who teach us how the market is evolving, how the practice of making places is evolving. So that 
That, that's you. great. And Mentor, for you, so uh, clearly a, a big component of your work is indigenous practices and resources. And how do you think about, again, that tension between um, what's going to work on one individual project in India versus opportunities for scalability and replicability, kind of given the, um, the urgency of the change that, that we need to, to implement? So whatever little my experience has been, it is first is to remove the obsession uh, from the fact that one size fits all because it does not. Uh, the, that's, that's, again, my limited understanding. But the essential problems that we are solving for, irrespective of the context or the geography that we are solving for, those questions remain the same. How do you create uh, human settlements that maximize human potential? How do you do it at a, in a way that it is truly environmentally and socially regenerative? Now, those framework of questions that one can ask before they start any project, uh, can be the same and the solutions depending on the context will be very different. And I think that there are uh, sharing of knowledge that is, that is extremely useful as we go ahead navigating these questions. And how does Arab approach some of these questions around global scale and multinational replicability? So I think um, with climate change, there's so much to do and there's so much for everybody to do. There's sort of a question always about how does the thing that I'm doing fit into what we're trying to do as a whole? And I think that there are some very interesting things about every individual project can always do more and can do better so it can respond to its local environment, it can respond to those big questions about maximizing human potential, you have to listen really hard. But actually what those projects do, each of those individual projects do, is kind of expand the envelope of what's possible. They make people believe that it is possible and then they, sort of serve the purpose of being the, the one who went first. So there are many clients, and when it gets to scaling, this is a problem, who don't want to be the first person to do something. They want to do something that is cost effective, that has been tried and tested, that has been worked through before. So those individual projects kind of create the context within which you can say, yes, it's been done before, and maybe it didn't cost a fortune. And then you can start saying, well, if it was possible there and it meets the needs, then actually everybody should be doing it. And you begin to get a kind of market change Catalyst, catalysm, whatever, catalytic something going on in that, in that moment. And I think at that point, you sort of have to move away from the individual actor at building level and start thinking about, well, what does society do with this? What does government do with this? What, who are the other actors that are in this whole piece that actually begin to get you this change at scale? Because it's difficult to do change at scale at one project at a time. I would contend that it's probably impossible. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I, I spent a couple of years here in New York um, working for NYSERDA, which is the billion dollar a year clean energy agency. After Hurricane Sandy, we stood up this community microgrid initiative. And um, one of the big questions was, how do you calculate ROI, right? How do you think about uh, avoiding outages for not only critical infrastructure, but also uh, for increasing the distributed generation on the system that ultimately would make uh, our building stock m much, much more resilient while also um, reducing emissions and uh, improving um, uh, grid benefits for, for the entire system as a whole. And without a system in place, it's very, very difficult to get an apples to apples comparison. But I, I just want to come back to the notion for a second of um, the being first of its kind. So here, here in New York City, for those of you who uh, who don't know, uh, we have a local law uh, called Local Law 97 which is arguably the most ambitious uh, emissions reduction legislation of any uh, city in the world. It requires a 40% emissions reduction by 2030 for, for 50,000 buildings, commercial and residential, uh, that are larger than 25,000 square feet. So 50,000 buildings that are larger than 25,000 square feet. Um, and that pathway to getting to an 80% emissions reduction by 2050 I think is really a game changer in, in many ways. How do you think about what that means for confronting the climate crisis in New York and are other cities looking at that as a, a possible um, place to follow? So I think we know that other cities have looked at it as a, as a place to follow the idea that you, um, first of all, begin to report on all of your emissions, whether it's for water, your, your usage for water and your emissions and fuel use for all of the other kinds of fuels. And there's a very good database in New York because there's been reporting going on for I don't know, about 15 years. It's certainly a long time, local law, 84 and so on, sooner. And having got that data, it becomes possible to say, okay, if this is the amount of fuel you're using and these are the factors that you need to apply to turn it into carbon emissions, how do you then reduce that and actually get to something that you can change? 
So the, there's a lot of things have happened in Local Law 97, or since Local Law 97 was put into place. Uh, it came in with actually quite a long lead, it, the, the first buildings that have to comply with Local Law 97, as in they have to pay a fine if they don't have the right carbon emissions, don't happen until 2024. I think the law was passed in 2019, so it's a long, a long gap. It's a classic kind of theory of change. You make people report, you set some rules, then you tighten everything up. When it was when the law was first set, there was no kind of envisaging that the grids in New York would get clean quickly, and the work of NYSERDA has actually made those grids get clean quite quickly, which means that many buildings in New York get actually a pretty good lift from the fact that the grid is decarbonizing, especially if they're already quite heavily electric. And so when the law first came into place, I think there was a lot of thought that it would be very much about energy efficiency at a building scale. And as it's come into place in the, the CLCPA, which is the, the state law about the decarbonization of the grid has come into place, it's become a really a, a big debate about is it about electrification or is it about energy efficiency or is it about energy efficiency and electrification and to what extent does a carbon fine drive each of those different kinds of behavior. So it's been a really interesting ride and I think in, in other cities have been able to see the trajectory coming a little more clearly and we know that there's legislation in Boston and in DC that is kind of heading in a similar direction, but yeah. with a different understanding of context. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to that uh, interesting dynamic between electrification and efficiency, just out of curiosity for the audience here, if you've heard of local on 97, can you raise your hand? That's interesting. It's like three quarters of the audience. I think uh, I've heard a local politician say for most New Yorkers who don't know any local law, uh, local law 97 is the one that they that they do know uh, and are following closely. Elizabeth, I'm, I'm curious to get your uh, thoughts on this split between elect electrification and efficiency. So this is like Jevons paradox. Wh which uh, which side of the coin do you stand on that issue? If we're getting clean hydrogen or local solar or offshore wind, um, does efficiency matter? I would of course say yes. I think it has to be both, right? So if you have a place that runs on clean energy, but it encounters some sort of weather event or there's a resilience challenge, you need that energy efficiency. It also, of course, takes energy, both embodied energy and operational energy to produce energy. So the more that we can reduce our building's need, um, when possible, build smaller, build in a way that's oriented toward the site, for the people, um, and make it beautiful, make it durable, uh, make it possible to maintain easily, flexible. Um, all of those things contribute toward an energy efficiency um, that incorporates electrification and, and builds on a more firm platform. Interesting. I didn't know LEED gave out points for beauty, but it's, that's great to hear. <laughs> we don't, we don't. That's up okay. to the beholder. For the record. Yeah. Um, we had an, a question maybe uh, that Manvendra can take for, uh, from the audience. The, the question is, what does a zero carbon footprint approach represent in terms of added costs? Or is that a myth? How do you think about the cost of getting to net zero? Uh, it's also, I mean, it's, it's interesting how we define cost. What is really the true cost of doing anything? Uh, and largely it is the oblivious, uh, I mean, it's when we are oblivious about what the true cost of anything is, the true social cost, the true environmental cost, is when we uh, make decisions without really knowing what the true cost of, of something is. So I feel that if one ran the actual cost of any choice and uh, uh, then compared that a zero carbon thing cost, uh, it would definitely be the most obvious choice to make. Uh, that's, that's what I think about it. So it's not a myth, it's uh, as soon as you put the true cost of anything. I think it comes back to your comment about ROI. What is the ROI of the thing, right? And I think that this idea that every project that you're trying to make net zero at the moment is still an exemplar. It's still trying to bust the envelope out. So the return on investment is not how much energy do you save and can you make it pencil out at the building itself? Actually, a lot of it is about shifting the envelope of what is possible. So the return doesn't necessarily come to you, but the question about ROI is, what are you changing by doing things in a, in a better and different way? So it might be that the very first time you do something, it doesn't matter whether it's net zero carbon or putting marble in the lobby, right? It doesn't matter if it's the first time you've done something, nobody will know how to do it. It'll be more expensive than it is in the long run. Yeah. So the this idea about 
every building having to be net zero carbon and be net zero cost, additional cost, in the first instance is, is it's, a, it's a tough thing to do because it's the first time you're doing something. There's a lot of risk, a lot of new things that you're trying to build in each in that scenario. Sure. That you know they they'll get paid for somewhere else and by somebody else. The return doesn't accrue to the right people, so it's not a classic ROI. That's right. And there's really no value on resiliency, too. really. Yeah. Yeah. Just just wanted to add that you know it's a very important uh, point. Not even knowing what, not even being careful about what the true cost of anything is, but who is actually paying that cost. Uh, one can put. Uh, a great deal of materials that extremely co I mean, cause a lot of pollution where they are produced. And uh, often many things that, that we wear or consume, uh, they have huge, huge amount of uh, cost elsewhere. So when you equate all of that, I suppose the, the conversation becomes more meaningful. Uh, I want to recognize that this conversation is happening about a decade after Hurricane Sandy here in New York, and obviously there's a lot of people down in the Gulf who are suffering from uh, Hurricane Ian, and obviously uh, uh, the monsoons in, in Pakistan. Um, curious to kind of get your thoughts on local approaches to community resilience, so the kind of adaptation and mitigation angle of this. I, I um, read something just recently, the EPA, I think, estimated that without any adaptation or mitigation, uh, extreme weather was um, uh, anticipated to cost Americans, I think, $5 trillion uh, between now and 2040. Um, but just curious to know, like, when we talk about confronting the climate crisis, in many cases, it actually comes down to what, what communities are doing. And so um, maybe, uh, Fiona, we'll start with you. And, get your perspective on where community-led resilience projects are? So I think that um, having lived through Sandy and worked pretty extensively in resilience in the first five years or so after Sandy, I think one of the things that has become really clear, it, it hits you over the head every time a disaster happens, is that people value risk and resilience quite highly for maybe the first couple of years after the event has happened, and then they start discounting the future very, very quickly thereafter. So you'll comment, you know, resilience has no value. Resilience has a ton of value, but we're not very good at recognizing it on our projects because of the discounting that we, sort of mental discounting that we do. Oh, it'll never happen. It's a 100-year flood. We just had one. There won't be another one for another 99 years. All of those kind of fallacies about re re recurrence time. So I would say that right after Sandy, and actually right after Katrina too, there were an enormous number of efforts around getting the community involved, understanding how you look at adaptation and mitigation, not only through a climate change, really technocratic kind of lens, but also, also through a social lens, and think about what, 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 can, what are the things that you can do that are not only good for resilience, and mitigation, and adaptation, but also good for the social fabric. It's mitigation and adaptation in that sense, I mean in a very technical, technical way. It won't flood, it, whatever it is. And actually putting, the, putting that whole picture together changes all sorts of things about the politics of the things that are possible and the politics of things that are impossible. I think we've had several projects, I think this is probably reflected in your work, that if you're thinking about the social needs and the, the social needs of the community that you're working in, you actually get a very different kind of political push or political place to play in order to make that future change. So many of our most powerful projects have taken the idea about climate change and they said, okay, well, what are we going to do about climate change and social equity at the same time? And if you can do both things at the same time, actually you get much better, much more robust policies that are much better supported. Actually, I completely agree with you. Uh, I come, I spend a lot of time in, in a place that the world writes of as a desert, Jaisalmer, uh, where people who have taken the meager offerings of nature and turned it into extraordinary wealth of, you know, history, culture and everything, so just building on your point, droughts are a thing in the desert that everyone fears of. Now, anyone and everyone who does things to navigate that also gets generationally the highest amount of social pedigree in, in society. So people who are involved in building uh, wells that access deep aquifers, people who build khadins, which is the place where they grow food, uh, in events of great drought, also through generations, get the highest amount of social pedigree, this thing. And I, I, I wonder sometimes that if doing social good for a community uh, generationally uh, can somehow be incentivized in the way that society looks at you, and uh, that gets codified in culture 
and ensures long-term resilience. Uh, because even till date, if you go to, to many of these sites, you will know that uh, good behavior is really incentivized by the community. Good behavior that is good for the community. That's awesome. Elizabeth, I want to ask about uh, ways that LEAD is kind of adapting beyond benchmarking to maybe incorporate some of these principles or additional metrics around resiliency. Yeah, that's a great question. They, um, the critical thing that LEAD focuses on and that our conversation is focusing on is energy efficiency in terms of resilience. Um, water infrastructure and all sorts of other pieces are important too. but. In the past, we've primarily quantified energy efficiency um, based on cost. And in the newest version of LEED, um, there are additional metrics that are incorporated into the, the credits that benchmark those pieces that include um, carbon emissions, um, as well as the source energy, the renewableness of, of that source energy. And then we're taking into account more the life cycle um, analysis of, of all the different products that come into making a building and um, the, the emissions in each material. So all of those are, are pieces of that resilience package. Uh, Fiona, last question. Um, curious to get your take on Arab's commitment around embodied carbon. Um, what's, what's, what's been the takeaway for both individual projects and replicability? And also any first principles questions that uh, people in the audience should be asking as they embark on new developments? So the, the commitment that we made was to measure the whole life cycle carbon of the buildings that we were designing. So the whole life cycle carbon is all of that embodied energy and then the operational energy and then the destruction energy at the end, destruction and recycling energy at the end. So there are a few things that kind of happen through this. What turns out is that everybody wants to know at the beginning, they want to know what the impact of the big decisions or the small decisions that they're making right up at concept stage is going to be on the rest of the project. So there's a point of leverage at the beginning of a, of a project that everybody knows about, right? You make the decisions there actually set the pathway for the whole of the rest of it. You have much more leverage there than you do later. But you also have much, much less information and you don't know about what it is that you're going to necessarily do. And this matters. So for example, you want to decide whether you want to make a building steel or concrete because steel has 8% of the world emissions, concrete has 8% 8 of the world emissions. There's no obvious choice between the two of them. They're both incredibly energy intensive and carbon intensive and you need them to build a building. That's, that's what, we, what we do. So which is going to be better? And the data that's available around that is very general. It's like, this is what the embodied energy of steel is, and this is what the embodied energy of the embodied carbon of concrete is, and that's all of that you've got to work with at concept design stage. But actually, there are all sorts of things like responsible steel initiatives that are all about decarbonizing the production of steel. Some uh, steel plants are much better than other steel plants. Some concrete is much better than others because you can use um, cement substitutes or there are different ways of producing the cement. There's also a responsible concrete, responsible cement kind of action. And so the detail of what you're changing, actually, you could massively change your impact actually quite late in the design by specifying responsible steel or responsible concrete. Those things don't really exist yet and they definitely don't exist in every geography. But by the time you finish doing your design in two years' time, it doesn't change the... the Sort of the strength of the steel necessarily or the strength of the concrete, but what it does change enormously is the, is the emissions associated with it. So a few big problems, fundamental problems. One is nobody has the data about what the embodied carbon is, everything from the production to the transportation to delivering it. It's really variable depending on how it's produced and where it's produced. Everybody wants to make big decisions right up at the beginning, but unless you're choosing timber over steel, it's really hard to justify that decision immediately. And then as you go through a design, you know, the end, typical engineering thing is you take your, your construction model and you, you pull the quantities off it. But as you go through design, you draw more and more stuff. So the building gets, the, what you can actually pull off the model gets heavier and heavier. And so your building gets worse and worse as you go through because you've drawn more things, not because it's actually worse. So the way you do that is you have factors at the beginning to say, schematic design, I haven't drawn everything, so you need to multiply it by X. You kind of keep going through. So there's sort of fundamental in detail questions about what is it? When, what is the point at which you can actually make a decision? What is the impact of that decision? And then is the data good enough for you to be actually able to make it? An operational, which used to be the thing that we worried about all the time, if you've electrified your building, it's going to be zero into the future. So you don't, and the grid's decarbonized. So the, this important piece 
that was been, we've been obsessed by for years is suddenly not the most important piece that we're dealing with. So mm. the expertise is in the wrong spot. Uh, Ma'am Vendra, I want to give you the last word here on f principles uh, and first questions that we should be asking as we think about new projects, adaptation, mitigation, um, for what's to come. Uh, I think, uh, I know we are just out of time, but uh, there's a short-termism that has creeped in, in in the way that we think. If we just start thinking generationally that I'm doing this, what is going to be the impact in three generations, two generations, just like indigenous communities used to think. Uh, it's the first, it's the first, always the first principle question to think generationally. Uh, that's, that's what I would say, things like water, air. What is really the true cost of doing anything? Uh, and if you can think that through, that I think will be a good first principles answer. Awesome. Well, I'm afraid we have to leave it there. Thank you all so much for having us. Thank you, Chris and the Resonance team. And uh, we look forward to seeing you during the break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.